Welcome back to our channel. This is Jose from Southern Life. On today's video, I'm going to be talking to you guys real quick about Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War, and Florida's history relating to African Americans because there's a lot of uh, people trying to cover up the history of the United States and Florida. So on today's video, I'm going to give you guys a, a few pieces of information. Uh, so first of all, when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in Cuba, Jose Marti, which is a philosopher, writer, journalist, and also a uh, national hero of Cuba, uh, in fact, arguably the most notable personality of Cuban history, um, Jose Marti is kind of like the George Washington of Cuba. Jose Marti was a writer, and he traveled between Tampa, Miami, the Keys, and Cuba, so he was in the United States, and he was in Cuba. He was back and forth quite a bit. In fact, I think there is a statue of Jose Marti in Louisville, Kentucky, if it still exists. There's one in Tampa. I'm pretty sure there's one in Miami. Now, Jose Marti wrote about Abraham Lincoln's death. And he actually had a group of him and other uh, followers, you could call, that mourned the death of, Jose Mar uh, of Abraham Lincoln. The reason they mourn his death is because Jose Marti was uh, pro pro Afro Cuban. In other words, he believed in, in, in the equality for African American Afro Cubans at the time. And uh, for Jose Marti and his followers at the time, the death of Abraham Lincoln was a huge loss because of slavery, because he abolished slavery. And so in the United States, you know, when you read literature in English, there's a perspective on whether it's coming from, you know, a southern or a northern mentality or union mentality. But the thing about Jose Marti's writings is one, they're verified. Two, they're historical documents and records. And three, he wrote these things in Spanish. And the Spaniards already, before the civil rights movement in the United States, had somewhat of an understanding of, you know, not that English mindset, which was mostly slavery. Therefore, we can rely on Jose Marti's writings, and when he wrote about Abraham Lincoln's death, the main thing that stood out to him, being a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln, was that he stood for the abolition of slavery. Which means, when you look at the United States Civil War from the perspective of the United States, versus when you look at it from the perspective of, let's say, somebody, a writer in Cuba in another language, keep in mind, Cuba is only 90 miles from the United States. Um, there's just so much misinformation about the Civil War regarding Florida. Um, but basically, for the most part, here's an outside perspective. And while in the United States, there's literally people trying to rewrite history, in Cuba, these records, because Jose Marti is Cuba's national hero, have really been preserved in their accessible, in their original state. In other words, it's not tampered. Uh, the writings and, and, and just thoughts of Jose Marti are, are national treasure to Cubans. Therefore, his writings on Abraham Lincoln, you can perceive, are the real thoughts of a contemporary. And they mourn the death of Abraham Lincoln. Not because of Westward expansion. What, what, what mattered to him at the time was that he was an abolitionist. He wanted to end slavery. So... To those people who say that the Civil War is not about ending slavery, well, you have to understand that in Cuba, American history is written. American history is taught in Cuba, um, and it's kind of untempered. Cuba doesn't really have any political interest with the United States. Um, in fact, Jose Marti was mostly focused on getting people from the United States to help free Cuba so Cuba could be an independent country. 
when I lived in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, there's a town called Wetumpka. And in Wetumpka, there is a cemetery. And if you go to that cemetery in Wetumpka, you'll see SPAM, Spanish American War. Now, the Spanish American War, a lot of the South, the core of the South, supported the Spanish American War. Now, now we're talking like uh, after that point, we're talking like early 1900s. With the Spanish American War, a lot of the Deep South supported the Spanish American War. Now, what a lot of people don't understand about the Spanish American War is that it was really an effort to get rid of Spain's influence from Latin America. It wasn't exactly English speakers versus Spanish speakers. In fact, it was English speakers in the South for liberating Cuba, Puerto Rico, Latin America from the empire of Spain. They wanted Latin America to be free independent countries without the influence of Spain, which is what Jose Martí would have wanted, Cuba's national hero. In fact, he died in that war. Uh, some would say almost as a martyr to the war. But regardless, it's crazy how today, and this year, I lived in uh, the same county as Wetumpka. I lived in Elmore County, Alabama. And as a Cuban, the people there um, have a lot of hate and resentment towards Cubans and, 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 and anybody that's Spanish. But it's interesting, though, that their ancestors fought to liberate my country. So at some point, allegiances shifted, mentality changed, because in the early 1900s, these individuals in Wetumpka, Alabama, in Elmore County, lots of them, I'm not saying one or two, I mean, if you go to that cemetery in Wetumpka, just north of Wetumpka, right, right outside the city, um, it's just so many people that, sp that fought in the Spanish-American War are buried there, and it's the most prominent, um, it's the most prominent thing on their gravestone. You have, in one generation, the Civil War, then you have the Spanish-American War. The Spanish-American War was for that generation what the Civil War was to the previous generation. So when you look at that, you tell yourself, well, apparently these people went to war and they put it on their gravestone, so when does the South go from let's support and keep in mind the South was pro-slavery and the movement in Cuba for liberation was not pro-slavery but at some point there was a shift of mentality to where if you were to go back to Civil War era mentality and alliances during the Civil War and the generations that followed the Civil War up to the Spanish American War, they were for Latin American independence. In fact, if you look at the Confederate flag, it's a cross like this. The Confederate flag is the cross of St. Andrews, the cross of the Spaniards. Think about that. The Confederate flag itself, the Confederate battle flag, is the cross of St. Andrews, the Spanish flag of Florida. Why did the Spaniards have any influence on the Confederate flag? Why is the Confederate flag, why is the Confederate flag giving honor to the cross of St. Andrews of the Spaniards? Well, for one, the Confederates thought that the Spaniards were brave and valiant warriors. Keep in mind that the Spaniards were the first to colonize the South. The English did not get rid of the natives in Florida, Alabama, Georgia, at least southern Georgia and western Georgia. It was the Spaniards who um, eliminated the native presence so that the European could inhabit North America. In other words, the forefront of European colonization was the Spaniards, not the English, not the Irish, not the Germans. It was the Spaniards who were the first 
Europeans to colonize North America. And they were known to be brave and valiant soldiers because they went into places where the English would not go. Whether hostile, whatever, the Confederates were under the mindset that the Spaniards, in fact, 2000, now keep in mind that back then, Cubans and Puerto Ricans were not viewed as Cubans or Puerto Ricans. They were viewed as Spaniards from the island. So Cuba and Puerto Rico would have been the same thing. Uh, therefore, we don't know if they're Cubans or Puerto Ricans, but 2,000 Cubans and Puerto Ricans supported the Confederacy and 1,000 supported the Union. So, bringing it way back to the Civil War, Cubans and Puerto Ricans were on both sides of that. Okay, now, most likely, I suspect... The Puerto Ricans would have been in New York with, the, with you know, with the Union, and, and Cubans in the South and Louisiana, maybe with the Confederates. But again, there's no distinction made. There were Spanish, Spaniards of Spaniards descent. There was 2,000 with the Confederates and 1,000 with the Union. So, in that aspect, uh, Cubans and Puerto Ricans were kind of split between Unions and Confederates. Now, we're about to drive to Fort Myers, Florida. Fort Myers, Florida was a Union fort during the Civil War. Okay, so Florida, while being in the South, did not have Confederate forts or establishments. It had Union forts and establishments. A lot of people here in Fort Myers take up history for what they, th they think it was. But they don't realize that Florida, despite being a Confederate state, not exactly. The Manatee River, just behind us, separates North Florida from South Florida. Down here, it is a swamp. No cotton. North of the Manatee River, you have the first plantation. The southernmost plantation in the United States is in Ellington, Florida. Ellington is just outside of Branton, south of Tampa. So, north of the Manatee River, you had plantations. South of the Manatee River, you had Cuban fishermen, no cotton. In other words, South Florida, while technically part of Florida, did not depend on slavery it depended on fishing now when we go to the records of South Florida historical accounts that exist to this day in the universities historical accounts well documented even during the time that South Florida belonged to the English under the English flags all this coast right here that we're driving past right now was inhabited by Cuban fishermen. Further inland, little towns like Arcadia would have, at the time, had cattle. Now, during the Civil War, you had cattle raiders that came to get this cattle because there were Union blockades along the coast. So one of the few things that the Confederates could do is come through Central Florida, come into Southwest Florida, and catch the cattle. Now, the Spaniards did two things. They had pork and cattle roaming freely in South Florida. When they came, they brought horses, cattle, pigs, let them go. And that was uh, a more sustainable source of food for the Spaniards wherever they were. So during the Civil War, one of the few entry points that the Confederacy had to bring food, sugarcane, and rum which is still being made in South Florida. All right. Now, in South Georgia, they're making rum too now. Uh, in Ridgeland, Georgia, they make rum. But for the most part, the Confederates, one of the few entries, since they had blockades all through the Gulf Coast and all through the North, one of the few entry points of food to the Confederates 
during the Civil War came from Cuba or South Florida, or the combination of both working together. Once you got to about Yankee Town, once you got to about Cedar Key up that way, even in uh, home Sassa, there was points that were already being used to smuggle stuff into the Confederates further north. But down here, Fort Myers, for example, was a Union fort. And in fact, Fort Myers was an Afro-American Union fort. So you have to understand that Florida, while technically was a Confederate state, a lot of the territory in Florida at that time was not even closely uh, in the hands of the Confederates. Once you move further north from the Florida, yes. It just didn't happen because down here in South Florida, you're talking sugarcane, pineapple. It's a different agricultural life. An agricultural life that did not depend on slavery. One second, please. So, now there's all these efforts to try to hide the significance of, of the history of, of, of Florida. The Spaniards were different than the English. In fact, if you go to history, there were wars between Georgia and Florida. Why were there wars between Florida and Georgia? The St. Mary's River was a battleground. This is history. You can't make this up. The reason that the St. Mary's River dividing Florida from Georgia was a war zone is because in Georgia you had the English and in Florida you had the Spaniards. And the Spaniards, going way back to the 1800s and even before that, simply did not have the same view of slavery of African Americans or Africans in general. Why can we say that? Well, because in St. Augustine, Florida, there was a war which led to the purchases out west, it led to treaties, all that came from the Spanish in Florida harboring, allowing escaped Africans to be part of their communities here in Florida. In other words, the Spaniards did not, not only did the Spaniards back then not participate in slavery, they also did not treat Africans differently. We're going all the way back to the 1700s in Florida. War between Georgia English settlement in Florida, Spanish settlement, because Florida was harboring escaped slaves from Georgia. This led to, when Florida gets transferred from Spanish hands to English hands, seven boats left St. Augustine, packed with Africans, Africans that got on Spanish boats and went to Havana, Cuba. Therefore, Many Cubans in Cuba that are Afro-Cuban are descendants of African Americans from escapes from Georgia and the South. More than that, when the Calusa natives, the Native Americans that were right here in Southwest Florida, you start the Seminole Wars, you start the English colonization. Many of the native Calusa, Native Americans that were here in Florida, went to Cuba. So not only do you have African American descendancy among Cubans, you also have Native American tribes from the United States that escaped to Cuba to be with the Spaniards, to mix with the Spaniards to escape the English because the Spaniards mixed with Africans and Indians, but the English did not. So many Cubans like myself have French descendancy. Haitians, or white Haitians, French, would have at the time when the Haitian independence came to Cuba, Eastern Cuba. Cubans have French descendancy. Cubans have Native American descendancy. Cubans have Afro-American descendancy. Because anybody who could escape whether Native American or African American escaped the English, could cross Florida, go into Cuba, mix with the Spaniards, and escape the wrath of the English. 
Now, not all Native Americans that existed in Cuba, the Dominican Republic, were in favor of the Spanish. There was a war between them as well. In fact, the famous Cuban native, Atuay, was known and quoted for saying, the Spanish told the natives that if they did not convert, they were going to burn. But if they wanted to go to heaven, they would have to be like the Spaniards. So when they were going to kill Atuay, they captured this uh, valiant native Caribbean man. They told him, do you want to go to heaven or do you want to burn? Okay. And he was quoted for saying, are there any Spaniards in heaven? And they said, yes, there are Spaniards in heaven. He says, well, send me to burn. Not in that vocabulary. You understand what I said. And they burned him. So he said, if there are Spaniards in heaven, burn me. I don't want to be, wherever you guys are, I don't want to be. And they burned him. But he became a legend for that quote. I'm saying, if there are Spaniards in heaven, go ahead and burn me. And we come to the realization now that many Cubans, which as we know were here since the 1700s as fishermen, Native Americans, Native, oof, shit, a plywood on the road. Yeah, gotta be careful on 75. African American slaves went to Cuba. Native Americans went to Cuba. Cubans, like myself, are gonna have Native American Indian blood, gonna have African American blood because the Spaniards mixed. That's why when you go to Cuba, we're not white, we're not, like, you got Cubans like me that are green-eyed. When I was little, I was blonde, okay? You got Cubans that are me that are white, you got Cubans like me that are black. And sometimes in the same family, you'll have blondes and you'll have blacks. Why? Because we're just a mix of everything. Spaniards mix. In fact, the word Mexico, mezcla, mezcla, Mexico, mezcla, mix. Mixed between Spaniards and natives. So take the country of Mexico. The country of Mexico was founded under the ideology that because there was divisions between the native whoa divisions between the natives, nothing like flying at hundred miles per hour on a motorcycle on Interstate 75 where the sheet supply would land around. That's crazy. Another one. Crazy, crazy. You know, imagine that motorcycle on a sheet of plywood right now. That's crazy. Mexico was built on the notion of mixing between Native, Ameri Native Americans and Spaniards, thus the name Mexico. There was conflict between the natives and the, and the Spaniards, there's always some type of conflict, so they founded their country on the notion that nobody could be pure, everybody had to be mixed. And thus, that's how the country of Mexico was founded. And to this day, Mexicans, uh, over 100 million people, are one of the strongest national groups in all of North America because they found their country on mixing their races. And to this day, they are now neither Native American nor Spaniards, they're both. I mean, they have many characteristics of Native American, like their food, uh, their appearance to a large degree, and culturally, they speak the Spanish language. But it's a mix, grabbing from both, becoming one combined race, right? Simply from mixing and they did that to solidify their country and it worked that's why in Mexico you don't have the same problems as in the United States Mexicans are mixed between natives and Spaniards they're one country all the other countries that are kind of separated it's a mess they created a race Mexicans created a race basically so all that to say that even before all these things happened in North America, the Civil War, all that. The first ships that came from Spain already had Africans, English, and French. When the Spaniards came to North America, they didn't know what they were going to encounter in North America. Thus, the first ships that came had English, French, and Africans as translators. 
Duh. No history book will ever tell you that. But if you go and you read these accounts of history, you'll learn that the first Spaniards, even though Spaniards were the first Europeans to colonize North America, they brought with them Africans. Africans who were not slaves, they were generals. Mexico City, the first person to be a governor or a, uh, a head or a military commander of Mexico was African, black. The Spaniards had African conquistadors. They were black conquistadors. They were English conquistadors because the Spaniards wanted to have communication. If they came over here and they ran into Englishmen or they ran into Africans, they wanted to have somebody who could translate and communicate because that was their strategy. And it's in the history books. But no history book will ever tell you in the United States that the Spaniards had African conquistadors. At least not here in the United States because that's not what they want. But to the people here in the United States who want to change their history, you can change English history, but in Latin America, we have our own Spanish history. So you can change in English all the history you want. You can rewrite English literature, but in Spanish literature, we have a counterpart of your history, and you can't erase that because it's not in your language. Cubans mourned the death of Abraham Lincoln because he stood for abolishing slavery. Something that the Spanish had stood for for centuries. Being that some of the first Spanish conquistadors were Africans. Conquistadors. The people who came to conquer North America, they were Africans, native Africans who came to North America. The first black people to step foot here were not slaves. They were conquistadors. They were governors of states in Mexico. But they don't tell you that. Because in English, history has been rewritten to match the narrative. Learn. Study. But don't study what's coming out now. Grab a book. That's how, when you go to a part, when you go to a... When you go to an antique store you find a book in Spanish and French that's from the 1800s, pick that up. You can find a book that's 150 years old. They're everywhere. When you go to an antique store, look for the books that are old. It might be $10 for any random writing from the 1800s. Interestingly enough, people's view on racism has roughly been the same over the people think that racism uh, in the past was worse than it is now. People's views on racism have been nearly about the same from the start of a freaking civilization to today. There hasn't been any change in the way people view slave, uh, history of, of racism. It's been the same throughout. It hasn't changed. People have tried to change it to match their narrative, but it doesn't change. If you pick up a book from the 60s, uh, which I, I have, you know, one of the beautiful things about living here in Southwest Florida that there's a lot of wealthy people and wealthy people educate themselves very well and they pick up literature and I've had the opportunity uh, while living in Southwest Florida and you know to pick up literature authentic pieces of history dating back not just books I'm talking letters sent from a wife to a husband or uh, you know family records or you know you just start to learn uh, the entire history of a family some were French some were this some were that you just start to pick up, here's a Polish family, here's a French family, and you just start to really learn history of American families and their trajectory, what they did. You can get a real good idea of history. And not a lot has really changed in the way people view these things. Going back to the Spaniards. The Spaniards 
had conquistadors with them that were Africans. The English understood no notion of that. Okay, the English, which were the first colonies, they had no notion. And they've been trying to prevent and intervene with Spanish matters. Spanish matters means that we mix. We mix. We don't care. Um, the French are also very similar in that they make treaties and alliances with people. But regardless, the English have always wanted to interfere and intervene with Spanish affairs in that all this time the English were solidly for uh, their Anglo-Saxon just not mixing with anybody else not doing any dealings with anybody else the English were that mentality which is where the 13 colonies were founded from on the other hand the Spaniards were mixing with the natives from Peru Mexico Africans it didn't matter the Spaniards the Spanish mix take a look at the Dominican Republic the Dominican Republic is a black Spanish country Cuba about 30 to 40 percent of the population has African descendancy um, and interestingly enough over the years there's been this influx of people from Cuba to Florida and from Florida to Cuba back and forth to where South Florida I'm talking Fort Myers Naples Miami, West Palm Beach, uh, Arcadia, I'm talking like the southern tip of Florida and Cuba, not in the last 30 or 40 years, not since the 1960s when all the Cubans came over here, even before that, in the 1900s, 1800s, 1700s, and probably even before that, have been DNA the same people. South Florida is Cuba. There's been just an interchange of people from runaway slaves, Native Americans, Spaniards, Cubans coming to Florida, Floridians going to Cuba. Now, in the records, like if you start looking at the records, there were people from Arcadia who would go to Cuba. And there's a lot of stories of English going to Cuba to do business or whatever, and they would just disappear. So it is possible that in Cuba they had some type of they didn't want the English to come. So, I mean, that, that, that exists back and forth as well. Um, allegedly, that's what family history is. You can't really determine nothing from that. But regardless, the state of Florida, South Florida, has had an influx back and forth, interchange of people going back hundreds of years. Where, let's say, here's a Cuban who's just been in Florida 20 years he could be a native Calusa Indian Calusa Indians went to Cuba African Americans went to Cuba the Spaniards were here since the 1400s not the 1700s Spaniards had grandchildren in Florida when the English pay, played Turkey Day with friendly natives. When you had your first Thanksgiving in the Northeast, here in Florida, the Spaniards already had grandchildren. You might see a Cuban that's been here for 20 or 30 years. That Cuban, just for being Cuban, might be more geologically, uh, that's not the right word. Ah, what's the word I'm looking for? His ancestry, may actually be more native than yours because Cubans have escaped African American blood they have Spaniard blood they have Native American blood that was here in Florida and went to Cuba a Cuban that comes here right now from Cuba might be more native than you are if you go back to history true or false but it's interesting to see, you know, because I study Spanish history, and I study English history, and it's interesting to see how many of the things that I learn about American history from real documents, I'm talking real documents, something you can physically touch and see that it's 
appreciate that it's, you know, era accurate, right? And you read a, a, a book printed in 2023 here in Florida, and it says this about history, but this book was printed three months ago, and this book that is in my hand now was printed 150 years ago. This one's more authentic. Now, could they have been trying to change history 150 years ago? Possibly. Well, you start to look at family records, you start to look at actual historical accounts, hard to manipulate that stuff. Information in, in history, it starts not so much with your nationality or your race, it starts off with your family history. It's something that people try to possess. People, people hide family photos and steal family heirlooms and stuff like that because people perceive that there's some type of power in being a gatekeeper to their family's heritage. And that happens everywhere. Um, in fact, even within the documents of family arms and history, you'll find pieces of the documents that will confirm to you that people within those documents I want to uh, there's they're mud now. They're out there in the swamp mud right now. That's where I want to be out there mud and that mud down there. People try to cover up history. It starts off on a family level. And then it just keeps growing and growing and mushrooming. But there it is. That's a little bit of Florida history that you should know. Um, and this isn't, again, uh, royal. This is real crap. We know in the middle of Estero Bay here in Fort Myers is Mound Key. Mound Key was the capital of the Calusa Indians. Mound Key, if you look at it, you see the mangrove line and it's perfectly flat. Well, the elevation in Mound Key at the top of that mound is actually flush with the mangrove line. So that, if you are standing on top of Mount Key, your elevation may be, I don't know, 30, 40 feet, but you're just flush with the vegetation line. In other words, somebody standing on Mount Key can see across all of Estero Bay, but if you're in Estero Bay, you cannot see Mount Key because Mount Key at the top comes flush with the vegetation line from the mangroves. Thus, the interesting fact about Mount Key was the capital of the Calusa Empire, inhabited by Spaniards going back to the 1700s on record. On record, going back to the 1700s. Cuban fishermen, Spaniards. They would come to Florida during the winter, during the mullet run. They were not here year round. They were just, they were transient. They would they never really set up camp here. Um, and thus it created uh, a flow of trade the first uh, I think the, the, the oldest real buildings down here in the Everglades is the small Smallwood store in Everglades City and the Smallwood store just so you understand what I'm saying the Smallwood store in Everglades City despite being English people that were there traded with the natives Everglades City is at the mouth of the Everglades on the water despite being an English settlement they traded with Native Americans now that to the outside world would have been a problem because they were Native Americans that were fleeing from the Seminole Wars and all that but it's just you understand that in South Florida even the English that were here lived the way the Spaniards lived because the geography of land was not based around the ecology. Everything was based around trade, not plantation life. Small wood store in Everglades City were English people, they're Americans, and despite the fact the Americans were at war with the natives, they made their living by trading between the natives. You understand? So not just the Spanish, even the English that live in South Florida had to live by those rules because those rules were dictated by the ecology and the geography of the land, not by the culture of the people many times. 
to where that even the early English people that lived in Florida lived by somewhat the same rules as the Spaniards. That is why the Dominican Republic did not have slavery. Why did the Dominican Republic not have slavery? Because the Dominican Republic's geography was for cattle ranching. The Dominican Republic and Haiti are the island of Hispaniola. The Haitian side happened to lend itself perfectly for agriculture, slavery. Haiti had agriculture, Haiti had slavery. But the Dominican Republic was mountainous, and thus, agriculture did not prevail. Thus, in the island of Haiti, you had Dominican Republic, which were Spaniards, based off of cattle herding. But when the geography changed, you entered the country of Haiti, it was French with slaves. So Haiti speaks French, they were slaves. The Dominican Republic were Spanish, they had cattle. That division between the French and the Spaniards was made by geography. A geography that meant that in the Dominican Republic you couldn't have slaves because you didn't have agriculture. And the same thing happens in the United States with the Appalachian Mountains. South of that you got the Black Belt. Yes, you had slaves. North of that, you didn't have so many slaves. It's all geography plays a huge role into where people go, where they don't. That's a little bit of history for you, and it's interesting to see how Florida's trying to rewrite their history. Yes, they put up a Seminole train right there. Interesting. Check it out. That is some Florida history for you. Florida history that you can grab a book and read and appreciate as authentic and genuine. You know, going back to Ellington, they have that, um, they have the uh, Gamble Mansion in Ellington, which is the southernmost plantation in the United States. They give you a tour. And they show you the mansion where the white people lived. And you know what they don't show you? The barracks where the African Americans were. And what they don't show you is they don't have the cisterns, uh, the, the kettles, I mean, that they would have used to process the sugar cane. In other words, it's not an authentic historical place. You can go there and you can get a tour of the Gamble Mansion. In fact, it's run by the Daughters of the Confederacy. You can get a tour of, of, of the Gamble Mansion right outside of Branson, Florida, but it's not authentic. The reason it's not authentic is because they're only showing you half. They're showing you what happened over here, but in the back, you're supposed to have another Where's the sugar cane? Where's the cattle? That did that happen? Where 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 the, doesn't exist? Why doesn't it exist? Read books. Find historical books. Find books that you can actually physically appreciate their age. Um, crazy. Florida trying to get rid of its history. We're about to cross the Caloosahatchee River and we'll be in Fort Myers, all. Me and Fort Myers was a Union Fort. Unbelievable how many people in Fort Myers who say they're from here don't realize that Fort Myers was not a Confederate fort. It's a Union Fort. There's the Caloosahatchee River right there. Welcome to Fort Myers. Or as the locals would say, Fo my dog. Fo my dog. Check it out. Florida history.